Congressman Bishop, thank you for meeting with us today. We genuinely appreciate it. Um, you're asking the voters for a fifth term. You've completed four. Uh, what is it that you've done in your first eight years in office that uh, would merit the respect of trust of another two years in office? Well, fortunately, I, I hope I am with the mainstream of my district, but I am on the right committees that are significant for my district. So the, the resource, uh, armed services, education committees, and I have leadership positions on those now. In, in addition, we've been fortunate enough to be as part of the task forces and caucuses that I think have very, effect, very effectively help our district. So being the, the chairman of the Western uh, Caucus, as well as uh, the chairman of the 10th Amendment Task Force, I think those type of things put me in a position to be the right place at the right time for my district. Okay, so you're talking about effectiveness, uh, time spent in Congress, and you're now in the right positions. There seems to be a mood in the nation that doesn't want this effectiveness, this experience at some level. They want people with new blood. Uh, what is it about the new ideas that uh, you'll bring to this uh, next term of office should you win? Fortunately, uh, the last couple of years have not been great years for Congress. And what I want to do is change not only the direction that we are going as a nation, but some of the procedures that we have. And I'm in the position to do those on those particular entities, which means the irony is, even though I am the incumbent, if you want change in Washington, I am the person that will bring about that change. Now, let's talk specifically about what that change is. I mean, what, what's been going on in Congress the last couple of years that has precipitated all of this hostility toward Congress? Approval ratings for Congress are hovering at all-time lows and teens low 20s. What is it that you can specifically do to change the way in which Congress does its job so that people have a better opinion of it? There, there are simple, easy answers to those. Include the concept that this Congress has spent money in a way no one ever thought Congress could spend. We have always spent too much, but it has been, ex it has been exacerbated in this last year and a half to a way that no one ever dreamed possible. It has been an effort in this last year and a half to try and consolidate more power in Washington for more programs that was never intended for Washington to do. So part of the program is, once again, rolling those back, um, making sure that people are not going to be subject to tax increases, making sure that our spending levels go at least to 2008, hopefully lower than that, going back with the idea of federalism so that we differentiate what Washington should be doing versus what state and local government should be doing because not everything has to come from Washington. If you really want efficiency and accountability for effective programs to people, you're going to have to empower the states and local governments to do even more than they have ever done before. Now, there's also some other things just within the functioning of, of Congress itself. We are horrible at time management. We do not allow members of Congress the time to go back to the districts and find out exactly what is happening to people and what our policies are doing. We do not allow time for members to actually do their jobs in Washington. Last Tuesday, I had three committees scheduled at exactly the same time. It's impossible to do that. At the same time, there was debate going on on the floor. That's one of the things I would really like to do. Almost every state legislative body does not allow that type of situation to happen. Washington shouldn't as well. Okay. Now, often you've talked about some of the specific, specific policies and then some of these procedures. What about the idea of closed rules? Let's say that the Republicans do win control of the House of Representatives this time around. Will there be a change in the way in which leadership manages the House and makes it more bipartisan and tries to create a bit more comedy in the House? There has to be. Uh, and how can that be done? I mean, it seems to me that over the last three or four cycles that enmity between the parties has just become worse and worse and worse. The percentage of closed rules has been going up and up and up and to the point where in the 111th Congress, there, it seems like there's almost been, uh, under democratic rule, this record amount of, of, of closed rules used. So how do you roll that back without uh, working with the other side to some degree? Part of the pledge to America that we, uh, we just made was the idea that, first of all, we would once again allow debate to take place on the floor. It, it is true that there are a number of closed rules which does not allow anyone, Republican or Democrat, to go to the floor and propose amendments. Has, has been massively increased under Speaker Pelosi. Uh, you simply have to change that attitude and say we will allow the process to work, we will allow committees to bring forth uh, uh, more amendments, we will allow members to go on the floor and especially on appropriations bill offer, offer amendments. But also is part of the process. One of the things we're talking about more and more is this concept of one issue, one bill. And part of the problem that this 
Congress has had under Speaker Pelosi's leadership is so many bills are written once again in her office and you compile all sorts of things together. There's no reason to have a 4,000 page bill. There's no reason to have a health care bill and then tack on all of a sudden student loans for universities onto the same piece of legislation. That's one of the commitments we have to change that approach. And can you do that in a, in a, in a highly partisan environment? Um, is that possible? Yeah, obviously you just change the rule and then allow that kind of debate. I do want to make trust between the parties. I do want to make one. That. I do want to make one thing a little bit different. There, there has been partisanship throughout the history of this country, and Congress has been much more partisan and much more divisive and much more violent in the history of this country than it has ever been today. We make a lot of talk about how there is no relationship between Republicans and Democrats. If you go back in history it was much worse during the 1960s. If you go back to the Civil War period where members were pulling out guns against each other, it has been much worse. If you go back to the 1780s and 1790s, 1790s, I'm sorry, where members were actually brawling on the floor of the House. Right, but, it, but, hasn't, but it, those, it has been much worse in history. So but, but don't overemphasize yeah. the, the kind of partisan relationships that takes place. But the 1960s, that was a, a, a big chunk of that was civil rights. So that was a major issue. And then you're talking about other periods of history when you have partisanship that was intense. But the size of the federal government was not nearly as large, and the stakes weren't nearly as high. It seems like now, with this partisanship, the stakes really do seem high. So how is it that you create these relationships with the opposition party that makes it possible for you to put a bill out onto the floor of the House under some kind of an open rule? Well, actually, first of all, in the 60s, it was Vietnam that was driving Vietnam and civil rights. That was far more than the civil rights issue that was taking place in the 60s. And it created much more animosity than we have today. But the issue is how you actually structure those kinds of governments. If indeed you have an open rule, you all of a sudden invite the other side to be able to come to the floor and make those kind of appointments. That has always been done before Speaker Pelosi as far as appropriation bills. Reestating that would be an easy way to do it. If you're talking about some of my concepts about how members of both parties should be expected to attend in committees and listen to one another and listen to the debate, all of a sudden you will have the opportunity of having much more dialogue than we have right now. With the system we have of lousy time management, so that no one really goes to the committees and goes to the hearing, you come in only for the votes, you break away any chance of dialogue. If we actually were to change the structure of, of how you operate the procedures of the House, you would create a better flow of, of dialogue, a better flow of ideas. There may still be partisanship, but it's not quite, it, it will be a lessened degree of partisanship. In most state legislatures, you see that happening all the time. It can happen in Congress, too. Okay, uh, why don't you uh, name for us uh, some of the members of the, on the other side of the aisle uh, you work with uh, uh, occasionally to try and get things done? Actually, uh, Abercrombie, before, before he retired to run for governor, is one of the great people. Who From would, Hawaii? Yes, who would always sit there and he would say, you know, my party doesn't agree with this, but I do. I'll vote with you. Uh, Dale Kildy is one of my good friends that we work with together on both education and resources. Uh, Rob Grijalva is uh, the chairman uh, where I am the ranking member. We disagree on probably every kind of policy implement, but he's one of the nice guys. Personally, I get along with him. And we actually can just talk there side by side as to where we're going with this next bill that's coming up, how we're going to handle those things. It happens. A lot of it deals with the personality of the chairman. In the Armed Services Committee, where I serve, the, the Democrat chairman, Ike Skelton, wants to have a bipartisan bill. Not only he, but his staff will work with me on almost anything. If I have a problem or I have a question, we have time to go with him. On a couple of other committees on which I serve, that is not the situation. Specifically education. Those staff, I didn't say which one it is, but those staff members will not meet with me. So it, it depends a great deal as far as the personality of the chairman. So I have seen where it can work and where it has not worked in this session. I think once again, if you try and structurally make it so that members actually interact more and are expected to interact both on the floor as well as in committees, you can enhance that at the same time. Even though philosophically, we're still gonna be different and the vote may not change. If you uh, were to uh, be reelected to a fifth term, would you stay uh, on those committees, education, armed forces, natural resources, or would you uh, seek to move up perhaps uh, to an exclusive committee, appropriations or rules? I, I've been on rules. The question is whether they would offer that to me again. I don't know, and I haven't well crossed that bridge when it comes. All I'm saying is I like the committees I am in right now. I am on right now. Uh, those committees are extremely important. They're the ones I requested. What are the next uh, issues that the 112th Congress uh, 
we'll deal with. What are the major ones? So, for example, on, on the budget deficit, what plans do, do you have uh, to, to solve that issue? Look, the, f the five big areas that we will hit as soon as the, the new session starts, and, and we're actually ready to hit them now if, if the dialogue will be allowed to go forward, deals with creation of jobs, um, lowering the budget and the deficit, Homeland Security and national defense, which is extremely important, um, health care, as well as government reform, how we structure the, the ongoing process of government differently. Those will be the big five areas in which we'll entertain ideas. Uh, what about the Bush tax cuts? They're talking about a lame duck session to maybe extend uh, the Bush tax cuts. Are, are you for uh, extension of the Bush tax cuts? This is the wrong time to increase anyone's taxes. And the, the sad part is that this decision should have been made a long time ago. One of the problems that we have in trying to increase the economy of this country is the, uh, the indecision that goes along with that. And I, I wish we'd learned the lessons from history at the early part of the Depression, that there were a lot of people who were willing to invest in the economy but were afraid because they did not know what the regulatory structure and what the tax structure coming out of Washington would be. It is the same situation today. If people don't know what their, their dividend tax liability or their corporate gain tax liability as well as their personal tax liability will be they're not willing to do anything that would move money around in the economy and actually expand the economy so those decisions should have been made a long time ago but at any rate yeah people should be able to keep more of their hard-earned money the death tax is probably the worst tax ever invented by man. It should be eliminated permanently. Uh, give us some insight into your thinking about how you balance these two issues of tax cuts versus deficit reduction. There's no question, right, that uh, letting the Bush tax cuts expire would be good for the federal budget deficit at some level. So how, how do you balance those two issues off against each other? Raising taxes does not automatically indicate you're going to get more revenue coming to the government. Historically, once again, it's actually been counterproductive to doing that. What we have to do at the same time is, first of all, allow people to have their money and allow them to use that to expand the economy as they naturally would. But at the same time with government, we simply have to quit spending what we're doing. The, the problem I have with this particular administration is the only area of the budget in which they want to cut or have talked about cutting and not have expanded significantly is in military defense, which is perhaps our only constitutional responsibility. I think that's a reverse process. Um, some people have called us that we should do as a first step to simply go back to the 2008 levels of spending. I think that would be a good first step. But also within that process is another reason why I'm so heavily involved in the Tenth Amendment Task Force. If you really want to try and sort out the funding dilemma in Washington, you have to come to the conclusion that we once again have to realize there are certain things that Washington should do and other things that state and local government should do. And if you want efficiency, if you want accountability, having state and local governments is a better place of having that. But if you can make that, if we cannot make that division, and everyone still thinks that every program has to run by, has to run through, be authorized by, and be funded by Washington, then we will never, actually never get a handle on federal spending. So that has to be an integral part, and I'm I'm excited that people really are talking about the concepts of federalism, uh, have, uh, allowing more choice, more options in people's lives. Okay, one more question: um, the war in Afghanistan. Um, how do you see that unfolding, and uh, what kind of strategy uh, do you think President Obama needs to pursue to make sure that that winds up successfully for United States security? I cannot foresee the future, and this is one area where I will not criticize President Obama's decisions in Afghanistan so far. I would have liked him to be more forceful and, and make those decisions quicker. But at the present time, he is still deferring to the people on the ground in the military who know what's going on to make policy decisions. As long as he does that, that is the wisest course to take. Okay. Thank you very much, Congressman.